Well, welcome back, everyone. I hope you all are ready to dive into our next section, captioned Black Girl Magic, Black Women Leading the Way. As the session's title suggests, we all know that black girls are magic. We have been leading the way and we continue to make strides. We've seen that most recently with the confirmation of the first black woman to the Supreme Court, Katanji Brown Jackson. There are definitely many firsts and many wins for black women, but we are still real and face real issues. Today, our speakers will explore not only the triumphs of black women, but also the challenges unique to black women as they push boundaries and lead in diverse fields. I have the honor of introducing each of these phenomenal black women right here. First, we are joined by Satana DeBerry. Satana serves as the elected district attorney right here in Durham County. As DA, she has prioritized the prosecution of serious offenses implemented policies to reduce unnecessary pretrial incarceration and work to improve trust and equity in the courts. She is a champion of justice and has received several awards recognizing that, such as the North Carolina Justice Center's 2020 Defender of Justice Award for Litigation. Satana holds an AB in sociology from Princeton. She's proudly wearing her colors. And she is also a double dukey. She has a JD from Duke School of Law and an MBA from Duke's Fuqua School of Business. Also joining today's panel, we have Anne Simpowski Ward. Like Satana, Anne is also a double dukey. A lot of double dukeys on this panel. <laughs> she has her mechanical engineering degree from Duke and an MBA from Duke's Fuqua School of Business. As CEO of Courier Brands and in typical black girl fashion, Anne has successfully transitioned a 40-year-old company to a high-growth, beloved portfolio of brands. In fact, in her 10 years as CEO, Courier has more than quadrupled its value. In addition to holding down Curio, Anne currently serves on the boards of two public companies, as well as on Duke's Fuqua School of Business Board of Visitors. Next, we have Tensi Taylor. Tensi is a native North Carolinian. She graduated from NC State University with a Bachelor of Arts in Communication and from the University of Southern California with a Master of Education. Currently, Tensi is a consultant for Linger Global, a global search and talent firm that places people across various sectors. In her work, she always keeps diversity top of mind. Prior to her work as a consultant, Tensi was a Hollywood red carpet host, and she's wearing red today too, <laughs> looking lovely. And one of her most prized moments is meeting and taking a selfie with Oprah. <laughs> also joining us today is Dr. Shakina Williams. Like, okay. <laughs> all right, I see that. And I love it. And like all our other panelists, Shakina is black girl magic personified. She is an entrepreneur, educator, financial coach, author, and diversity, equity, and inclusion implementer. Currently, Shakina serves as the executive director of the Center of Women Entrepreneurial Leadership at Babson. She received her doctorate in organization and management from Capella University, her MBA from Oklahoma City University, and her BS in finance and investments from Babson College. A lot of educated folks up in here. Um, and to round off our panel, last but certainly not least, we have Professor Adrian Len Smith. She will be our moderator for this session. Professor Len Smith is the Associate Professor and Associate Chair in Duke's Department of History, where she teaches courses on the Civil Rights Movement, Black Lives, Modern America, and History in Fact and Fiction. Her work has been featured in a range of media, including the recent PBS documentaries, Voice of Freedom and American Diplomat. Professor Len Smith holds a BA in History from Harvard Radcliffe and a PhD in History from Yale. And with that said, I will now turn it over to Professor Adrian Len Smith to lead what I know will be both an informative and transformative conversation this afternoon. Let's welcome her. Thank you, Tadena. So I'm gonna start us off, I think, with a general question and just ask y'all to jump in. So we've heard a bit about each of your backgrounds, um, but I'd ask, like you to expand a little on how you got to 
where you are, the path um, that you've taken, and um, with some emphasis, perhaps, given the, given the panel, on um, notable triumphs and challenges, um, and how you've maneuvered, how you've maneuvered them. And I don't know, I'm looking at you, Anne. I guess I'll ask you to start. <laughs> you want me to, okay, sure. <laughs> you made I'm the happy. mistake of making eye contact. I did make eye contact. Uh, well, I think, first of all, I am uh, probably a little bit of a different kind of breed in the sense that I started in a very technical life career. I'm an engineer, mechanical engineer, uh, and then made a complete switch to doing business. Uh, and for me, it was, it's truly like left brain, right brain, the very technical side. But one of the things that I realized early in my life, even while I was in engineering school, was it was less important for me to identify a particular career. So like to identify, I want to be an engineer, or I want to be a businesswoman, or I want to be whatever, an attorney, whatever it may take you. It was more important to me to really think about what drives me, what do I love? And I, when I think back to why I chose mechanical engineering, it's because I love how things work. And that was an, that is an overarching theme in everything I do. And so today, as a CEO of a company, I have to look at how things work in this company. And so sometimes I think about you know, career paths. And so I've had the opportunity to work on really large businesses, Procter & Gamble, large billion dollar brands. And then I made the switch to go into what I call scaling, growing companies. So middle market, entrepreneurial, private equity base. And People will say, well, that's so different. Those are so, you know, a polar opposite. And really what, gro what grounds me is the fact that I am really interested in how these organizations work and how they can grow. And so for me, that's kind of the story of my path. It's not about what I've done, because I have certainly have done and had the honor to do a lot of things and lead a lot of things. Um, but it's a really a spirit of what makes me happy, what brings me joy. And um, even on the boards that I serve, you talked about serving on boards, uh, or Tadina did. Um, and I've chosen boards that I want to serve on that, again, help me look at a company from a holistic point of view and say, how does it work? Um, and so I, I share that just as a starting point because all too often, even as we're young and we're in college or we're thinking about our next moves, if we're in a career, or if we're in the later stages of our career, we identify and we peg certain roles and things that we want to do, and we sometimes lose sight of why we want to do those things. It's not the what that matters, it's the why. And so for me, I've always been very um, focused on the why. And so, you know, any time that I steered away or, or veered away from understanding why I'm doing something, I found that far less fulfilled um, and that's maybe one of the learnings I've had is how do you get to the maximum fulfillment in what you do? It's when you really understand your why. And there's great books on finding your why. You can go read those books, but I think really all of us have the answer in our gut if we just take a moment to really stop and think, why do we love what we love? And how do we do that wherever we are, no matter if it's a career or it's even a life passion that you may have? Um, and so that's a little bit about you know, how I ended up and, and I, by the way, I never set out to be a CEO with the same mindset. Like, my goal wasn't to be a CEO. I just landed there because it, the truth of the matter is that's what CEOs do, is they figure out how things work, and they figure out how to make them work more efficiently, better, to, to deliver great results. Um, and so that's how I ended up becoming a CEO. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I have my parents to thank for firstly getting into the field of education. So my dad taught on the high school and collegiate level African American literature, French, and English, and my mother was a librarian. And my dad taught for almost 48 years, and my mother taught for almost 38 years. So education was ingrained and immersed in my household. And so once I graduated from North Carolina State University, my first job consisted of working for the president of all the universities in the North Carolina system. Erskine Bowles. And so learning under his aegis and hierarchy, I was just able to see the initiatives that he implemented, his commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and I got to know all of the chancellors at each of the 17 universities and formed rapports with them. And that's where my love and passion for education truly began. I worked on this project called the College Access Challenge Grant. 
where we took community college students to four-year universities for a day and exposed them to what was possible. So the prior panel, a lot of people talked about exposure. And we had sororities and fraternities uh, do a step show for them. We had financial aid come and talk to them about resources and scholarships. They got to have um, lunch in the campus dining hall just to show them that they could see themselves at a four-year institution. And the feedback from that was so phenomenal that these young minds didn't know what was possible when we then showed them what could be. And so from there, I knew that I wanted to further my career in education, which is why I left North Carolina, moved to Los Angeles, California. I tell people I had no family, no friends, just my faith, and I knew I could make it work. And I received my master's degree from USC, and after that, I worked for the Black Alumni Association for seven years as an associate director. And in this role, I helped mentor and allowed students to believe in themselves and to see what could be possible. I formed partnerships with students, with uh, entities such as the Los Angeles Lakers, Sony Picture Studios. I formed a partnership with Beyonce's mom, where our black students mentored the young people in her programs. And so I just wanted to show them what could be. And so being in the higher education world for almost 15 years, I then became a um, along with this opportunity at Lindauer. And Lindauer is a global consulting firm where we hire people at the C-suite level. So vice presidents, presidents, associate deans, CEOs, you name it, we hire them. And there are only 7% of consultants in the country are black. So there are very few numbers. And so when I'm talking to individuals and they see that I too am black, they thank me, oh my goodness, I'm so glad that we have an ally. I'm so glad that you are here to share your information and resources so that you can help us get to that position. So that is how I did different career trajectories. But before I left North Carolina, I told myself that I was going to take advantage of any and every opportunity that I possibly could. And so a gentleman on the panel earlier said, you never know who's watching you. I was at an event with Barry Gordy, and there was this lady who was watching me, and she comes up to me afterwards, and she says, I like your personality, I like your demeanor. Have you ever considered red carpet hosting? I had not, but I received my Bachelor of Arts in Communication from NC State. I got her business card, I followed up. That's very key, so make sure you follow up when you get people's business card. And I've been on more than 300 red carpets ever since interviewing people from Oprah to Denzel Washington, you name it. I've had the pleasure to interview them. So my, my other strategy I would suggest is wear multiple hats. So I'm an educator, I'm a consultant, I'm a red carpet host. I'm also an Amazon best-selling author of my memoir, Bullied from Terror to Triumph, My Survival Story, where I recount the 13 years of physically being bullied by students at school and how I turned those negative experiences into positive ones. So being a black woman, being a person of color, I have faced many challenges. Being young, being articulate, I've had a lot of white people say, well, you speak so articulate. And I say, well, actually, as you speak articulately, because it's an adverb. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get that straight. And what do you mean by that? So I use my power and privilege for good in a manner to educate the masses and let them know that we belong at the table and that society hasn't always treated us fairly. And now that I'm in a position to give back and to elevate and to inspire, I do so. So I just wanna say any of you out here who are looking to become VPs, President, CEO, please come find me. I'm at the conference all weekend. I will give you my business card. I would love to help you get there. I just hired two VPs of major institutions, and so I would love to help you get there. So please come see me. Also, can I just express some appreciation for your, sh your naming the part of speech? Mm. It's just like, <laughs> it touches my heart Thank so you. deeply. Thank it's you. Like, um, Satana or Shakina, just want to go, want to jump in? Oh, let me go. Mm. Okay. All right. So, how did I become the executive director at Babson College? I think, well, I think, I know I did full circle. So, I'm a Babson alum. My father made me go to Babson. I wanted to go to Spelman. But my parents were entrepreneurs for 35 years um, in, in a small town, hi Pastor Wesley, in Springfield, Massachusetts. And um, growing up in Springfield, I was really privileged to be part of some great youth programs, one being inroads and also part of a youth credit union program. And throughout my life, I knew entrepreneurship was gonna be a way. I, I love telling people what to do. I love sales, is working in my parents' um, beauty supply business. 
But throughout my career, um, being part of En-ROADS, I had an industry experience working in the banking industry. Um, my last corporate job was working in Pfizer, um, being a pharmaceutical rep. But throughout my life, education was really important because realizing that it is definitely a privilege when you get to go to college and you know, leave and explore the world. But coming to Babson was not really my decision. I think about our, if there's any development folks in the room. My, our development office definitely, they stay on top of you, give, give you a little money throughout the course of your year. And they call me every year um, until I, I got my PhD. And they want, they said, you know what, Shakina, why don't you come back to Babson? And I'm like, no, I, don't, I really don't want to come back to Babson. That's not my thing, <laughs> right? But they saw something in me and they introduced me to a program they were starting, the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Business. So I just think about my, my last couple of years working in the industry, sales, I was an adjunct professor in local colleges to bring all of my skills um, from the industry and also teaching to run a national program. And coming back to Babson has been a tremendous opportunity for me because I'm able to really disrupt what's really going on in the world, particularly when it comes down to black women entrepreneurship. And in 2022, I founded the Black Women's Entrepreneur Leadership Program, and I have some of my team here as well and some alums in the audience. But coming um, to be an executive director, if to share a little bit about my story, wasn't um, welcoming because the previous director resigned and they wanted to bring me in as interim. And I'm like, well, why do I have to prove myself if I'm part of this team already and if I've already been working at Babson and also working on national programs? And what it taught me, you talk about navigating, is really advocating for yourself, standing up and knowing your self-worth. And if the people that are, you're working for don't believe in you, then it's time to look for other opportunities and build your network. So. I was you know, really bold and had that conversation with my boss, who's an African-American woman, and also with HR, because this is some of the problems that we do face in predominantly white institutions, especially in higher education that, and I would say many industries, as black people, we always have to be either overeducated, we always have to like fight for what we want, and I'm like, if you want me, then give me the full-time position. So, and I, and I was actually on vacation when they called me, and it came with other conditions, so um, they thought about it, and they came back, and they said, well, normally we don't do this, and I said, well, normally I don't take second offers, so here we are. <laughs> so, um, we had a really great conversation, and it's great to be um, back at Babson leading the team. We're going through a lot of you know, changes, but it's great to be there as a role model because there's not a, black, a lot of black faculty nor a lot of black staff on our campus. But I know I'm there for a purpose and a reason. So every day I wake up really happy to work with my team and work with our students. But again, if I can leave something in this first question is definitely know your self-worth, be able and boldly stand up for yourself, and then also always have something on the side and be well networked because if it's your time to leave, it's your time to leave and you shouldn't be, you know, thinking that you have to be somewhere that people don't want you. So as a lawyer and politician, I am training myself not to be the first person always to speak. So. <laughs> And uh, first, let me take a point of personal privilege. And Derek uh, thanked Melvia Wallace. And I also want to thank Melvia. After she left Duke, she took her talents to New Jersey, which is where I met her. And uh, she's, been, uh, she's been impactful in the decisions that I have made. She may not know that, but it's great to be the first time to tell you in a room full of people. Um, so, and I'm also going to take Tinsey's uh, advice, and so Alvin Perkins look forward to an email. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I am the uh, elected district attorney here in Durham County. I am actually currently in the middle of a, a re-election campaign. Uh, the primary is May 17th. Early voting has started, and uh, so this is a particularly good time for me to talk about the challenges in my life, um, but also some of the successes. You know, I uh, went to Princeton, came here to Duke, uh, you know, I have a sterling resume, um, and I just did not want to be in corporate America. Like, and having those background, that background that is just kind of, when I went to Duke Law School, that's kind of where you went, right? You left Durham and you went to DC or you went to New York. Um, but you certainly didn't go back to rural North Carolina and you know, try to be a court-appointed lawyer. And um, 
you know, I went to D.C. for a little bit, and it just wasn't my life. And I'd grown up in a, a really small town, um, and like most of you in the room, I was, you know, super smart, you know, like I was a smart black girl, right, in high school, and, um, and went to Princeton, and I took a class called the um, Social Basis of Individual Behavior which was the introductory sociology class at Princeton. And up until that point, I was a molecular biology major. I was gonna be a doctor. Um, you know, when people say, what is the book that changed your life? Uh, the book that changed my life was Organic Chemistry, volume three. <laughs> <laughs> Some of you know this book, right? I think that book changed a lot of Everybody's people's lives. <laughs> so impactful, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> so, I took this introductory uh, sociology class. My parents had uh, gone to HBCUs. I told them I was going to be a sociology major. They were like, what the, you can fill in <laughs> the blank. But one of the, the, that class was really impactful for me for this reason. And, and it, because, you know, as that smart little kid, I thought I had made it, right? And what I learned from that class is that Almost, I mean, I'm smart, right? But almost nothing that got me to Princeton had anything to do with me, mm. Mm. right? I had managed to be born a Gen Xer, so in the kind of first generation of integration, so I'd had all these opportunities that had not been uh, available before to young black women. I had parents who had gone to college I had grandparents who had gone to college, almost unheard of in the rural South, right? Um, there were people in my community who had set things in front of me, um, which I just had to grab, right? And then I got to Princeton, and again, all these opportunities, all these connections to people, um, and all of these ways in which, which the systems that create the United States cracked just enough open yeah. for my little black behind the slide through, uh -huh. right? <laughs> and what I saw is then suddenly, um, who was it that said something this morning about, uh, I think it was uh, in the first panel where she talked about the, the lights coming up in the room. And so the lights came up in the room for me. And I was like, oh my God, there are, this, this is not available to everybody, right? There are people for whom um, educational system has failed them. There are people who are brilliant. I mean, I knew so many smart black people, mm -hmm. right? I knew people who could do anything. I knew black farmers, I knew black engineers, I knew people, black doctors, I knew people who could do everything. Um, and they were always the only one, mm -hmm. right? And that can't be true, right? It can't be true that only one of us is smart enough ever, <laughs> right? right? And so um, my career then became about how do I uh, change these systems? How do I really do real impact in these systems that impact um, the lives of communities of color and poor communities? Um, how do we just get a little bit closer um, to being able to participate fully, right, in this American dream that we all talk about? And so I did that for about 20 years of my career. I was an advocate. Um, on many, many different issues. I've been general counsel of state agencies. I've done, you know, kind of almost all the public interest work you can do. I've been a criminal defense attorney. Um, and, but one of the things that I learned as an advocate is that I was always knocking at somebody else's door, right? I was always trying to move somebody to do better. Um, and then some people in my community came to me and said, um, you know, we have been working on criminal legal system reform here in Durham for a couple decades, and we just aren't getting anywhere. And we think we're not getting anywhere because the district attorney just never listens. Now, when I was a criminal defense attorney, if you had told me I was going to be a prosecutor, um, I would have cussed you out, and I don't cuss. So, um, I just didn't believe that that is who I could be because when I was a criminal defense attorney, the prosecutors, if a prosecutor told me the sky was blue, 
I would not believe them, right? I would have to go outside and check for myself, and I would still think, right, that they had set it up, right? Um, <clears throat> and so at first I said no, but then I started looking at um, what was happening across the country with reform prosecutors, and, um, and I started to realize that you know, all those years I'd been knocking at the door, what happened if I was the door, right? And it has been transformative for our community. Um, it's certainly been transformative for me to understand that, uh, you know, we need to be the door to some of these things, right? Prosecutor's office is uh, historically a black box. We start doing research, I found out that 85% of the people in North Carolina prisons from Durham County are black men, 85%, right? Is that, is that right? Right, like we, we all have fathers, brothers, cousins, nephews, sons, mm -hmm. right? Are they all criminals? Mm -hmm. No, right? And so um, that's what we've been trying to do. Now, of course, that means I am no longer the smartest person in the room. When I was an advocate, people wanted to talk to me. They thought I was great. Now I am dumb. But <laughs> I am the dummy at the door. So. <laughs> um. So I'm going to take a point of privilege and then I'm going to follow it up with a question that I think emerges out of a lot of what y'all have said. One is to recall that a few years after I started teaching at Duke, a study came out that, that students, that black students who came to Duke, like by some, I don't know, percentage that seemed large to the studier, started out in STEM fields and many of them moved to fields like sociology or history or the humanities. And this was framed as a problem. And a student came to me, um, not a black student, but a student came to me with this almost as a challenge. How do you answer for this? And my response was, well, there are a number of ways. One, as a historian, I'm offended that this is somehow presented as if I'm in the lesser discipline. But even more than that, I want you to, I mean, right? I have pride. Um, but two, I want you to remember that people come to college for a variety of reasons and with a need to know a variety of things. And in the sort of service to the why and understanding that, or in the success of a liberal arts education that makes people realize that there are all sorts of things that they thought were settled that are actually questions, like they figure out where they need to go to figure out what, how to ask the questions to produce generative answers, and that can happen across a range of fields. So I feel that that's often important to say, and I think undergirds a lot of what y'all have put here. Um, I also hear in um, your statements a sense of like incredible personal accomplishment and moxie, right? Operating in a world with certain constraints. Um, and so you've said a bit about this, but I'm gonna ask you to sort of come back to it and, and to think like what are some of the actions or what are the things that we can do to kind of open up to, I mean, to, to, to combat massage noir makes it sound very grandiose, right? But to kind of open up the cracks. And I think that we can talk about that in an individual, like sort of in, on an individual level um, but then also structurally. And because I'm thinking about structures, I'm gonna ask you to start and then we'll just, y'all jump in as you mm -hmm. see fit. Wow, so what can we do to combat misogynoir? <laughs> or, or how about, what, what strategies have you employed? I mean, you've talked about sure. this to some extent. Um, and, to, and, and how much have you actually consciously thought about it? Or how much have you just been kind of like maneuvering to make to problem solve sort of moment by moment? I think that that is probably both. Um, I think there's no situation in which I do not understand that I'm a black woman. Um, you know, I think I have an mm -hmm. opponent in my current race. Who uh, also understands that you're a black woman? Well, I think it is because I'm a black right. woman that I have an opponent. Um, I think given, you know, what my community has said they want to see in the criminal legal system um, and the fact that they elected me over an incumbent um, says that this is what we want. Um, 
and yet I am still in somebody else's spot. Right? Mm. right? So it's, it's not ever our spot. Um, and I think that is really uh, the challenge when you chair the history department here. And that's not your spot for some of them. Right. Associate. Associate. <laughs> yeah. But um, so, so I think f for me it is a, a constant, well, it's not as much a constant struggle because I'm, I'm older now and I don't really care what you think of me. But <laughs> there, there are really points in your career where you know, you, it's a constant struggle between, well, they say it's not my spot. Is it not my spot? Like, am I wrong? Mm. Right? Do I have to? So, um, how do I have to look? How do I have to dress? How do I have to show up? How do I have to speak articulately? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't want to. No, I, I was going to say, you know, I wanted to build on this idea of our spot. Um, because I think that all of us have felt like, and all of you, I'm sure, have felt like we've been in places that is not ours. Not just isn't ours, but doesn't feel like ours either. And I think that one of the things that I think a lot about and I've thought a lot about in my career um, is I've been, I guess I've been lucky to be in some spots but I've also felt like I deserved to be mm -hmm. in those spots. And that's the thing that I think we, we can immediately walk into a spot and feel like a fish out of water, like we don't belong, like we're not, we don't feel seen, heard, valued. And the minute we create that talk in ourselves, it manifests itself outwardly too. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Right? And so, <laughs> Thanks. I think that's Kenneth Kelly out there. Amen. I, I know the voice, Kenneth. Um, and so I think that, you know, we have to really think about where we start in our own spirits and what voices and perceptions, you know, you were talking about how do I, how do I need to dress? How do I need to speak? When we let go of some of that stuff, we open up pathways for ourselves. And I, you may just be opening up the pathway. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy if you take that path, but it's opening it up. And so, you know, for me, I'm a 10-year backed private equity CEO. Let me tell you what that means. That means in every room I walk into in private equity, there is no one like me. Mm. Not a single person. Nobody who grew up a black girl in Detroit. Nobody who has gone the path that I've gone. There's a Detroiter in here, I hear it. <laughs> the D, what up, Doe? <laughs> uh, but nobody who has gone the path that I have gone, walked in the shoes that I have walked in, you know, having to pay for my own education at Duke University. Mm. Nobody wrote me a check to send me to Duke University. Now, that's not true of most of my Duke alum. There are some of us who had to write our own path, but there's a lot for whom mom, dad, grandparents could write a check. And more importantly, they haven't walked in my struggle going through corporate America and having to figure out, oh, someone tells you one day, now mind you, I'm an engineer, I'm technical, right? Somebody says, you know, we're really wondering if you might have a challenge in thinking and problem solving. Mm. Tell me about that. And that's a true story as, as, a, as a point in which somebody was trying to code, it was code for you don't talk or think like us. Mm -hmm. And so we're always going to be in these environments that aren't ours or that weren't created by us. It doesn't mean that we have to go out and create our own, but I encourage that. For those of you who have entrepreneurial visions, inspirations, aspirations, Go do it. Make places where we do fit in. But for those of, you, of, of us who choose to go through the other paths, there are ways to navigate, and it starts with our own self-talk. When we buy into the self-talk, it will manifest itself outward. And I just, I've always believed that. And one of the exercises I do sometimes when I'm in an audience, not 
like this one, but one that doesn't look like me, is I have people close their eyes. And I'll say, I say, and, and actually, let's do it in here today. Close your eyes. Everybody, just humor me for a minute. Close your eyes. Imagine or envision a CEO. Just think about it. What do they look like? What are they doing? Where are they? Do you know them? Are they anybody in your inner circle? OK, now open your eyes. How many of you envisioned somebody who looks like me or looks like you? Raise your hand. Well, I did now. OK. <laughs> I can tell you, when I do that in an audience that is not us, nobody raises their hand. Hmm. And I asked them specifically, did it look like me? Did it look like somebody like me? Nobody raises their hand. So starting here today, you have to envision it. Because by the way, we're still first and onlys in most of the places we go. Hmm. So if we're looking for somebody to pay, you know, paint a picture, to, to be an aspiration or inspiration, they may not be there. Because we might be the first or the only doing something in this country. So I just say to us, Let's really work on our own self-talk. And this isn't about denying all the systemic issues that exist, because this isn't about a bootstrap conversation I'm saying here. But I am reminding us that if we get caught up in that conversation that they put out there for us, we're going to hold ourselves back. Excellent points. And to piggyback off of that, I would say know your foundation know your worth, and know your family history. So my dad and mom, and my mom is here today, uh, were so instrumental in my upbringing. And my dad, God rest his soul, he just had such a way of teaching us, his children, about life. And my dad had many firsts. And one of his accomplishments was, um, out of 800 people, he was the only black person chosen to study abroad in France during the time of segregation. And when he got there, the white people asked, well, how did you get here? And my dad had a slick tongue. He said, by plane. Yeah, how did you get here? <laughs> but he knew what they meant. And by the end of uh, being in France, the white people, my dad was so adept at French, they were coming to him to learn how to speak so fluently. So they had this perception of who is this black man here doubting his academic prowess. But at the end of it, they were coming to him for knowledge. And so growing up, mom and dad always told us, you are excellent, you are worthy, and you are capable of doing anything you wish as long as you put your mind to it and you work hard. And so mom and dad had high expectations in the Taylor household. Mom was a sharecropper, grew up in a very rural county in Franklin County, and my mom could only go to school when it rained because she had to work on the farm. And when she was a freshman in high school, she had a D minus GPA. And she went on to graduate valedictorian and went on to attend North Carolina Central University. So there were no um, excuses in the house because mom had to study by candlelight. She had to milk the cows and the chickens and everything before she got to her coursework. And my dad had a, running, a joke. He said, yeah, we had running water in the house. I had to run to the well and run back and get it. <laughs> that was how he survived. So hearing their stories and growing up during segregation and, and just the injustices and iniquities that they faced on a constant basis inspired and motivated me as a young child. And now in my 30s, I'm like, wow, this is so amazing of how much they accomplished. So hearing their stories of where they came from and them going on to do great things empowered and motivated me to know that I could succeed. Regardless of the challenges or the iniquities that I faced, I knew where I came from. And so when I go to rooms where I'm the only black person, I walk in humbly but proudly because I know I belong there. I have the degree, I have the experience, I have the expertise, and many times people come to me afterwards wanting to know more about me. So I, in a, in a way, I kind of like when people second guess me because that gives me a chance to show you what I'm capable of. When I interviewed for an assistantship, a scholarship at USC, I was the only North Carolinian there. I still had my southern accent and twang. And this lady said, mm, where are you from? Like looking at me disdainfully. And I said, oh, I'm from the south. I'm from North Carolina. And she turned her nose up at me. Guess who got a full ride to USC at that assistantship program? So thank you 
So when people look at me a certain way, I don't say anything. I don't need to write a long Facebook or Instagram post about it. I just go and I let my academics and my ability speak for myself. So I would encourage all of you in here today, whatever room you walk in, you belong. If someone tries to tell you that you don't, don't listen to them. Don't get discouraged. Learn what you have to do. And then once you make it, give back. That's one of the things that I truly enjoy is giving back. I sit on five different boards. I'm involved in so many different organizations, but I love to give back. One of my students emailed me, former students, USC students, emailed me the other day to say that from freshman year, she was so shy when it came to networking, and now she landed her dream job at Netflix because of my mentorship and coaching that I helped her get. So I'm so thankful for my parents of how they raised my siblings and me, how they instilled not only education, but respect and manners. To this day, I still say my yes sirs and my yes ma'ams and my thank yous. Even in Los Angeles and Hollywood, when I'm talking to these celebrities, I call them sir and ma'am, and they're like, whoa, where are you from? So I never lost who I was. And so I would just encourage all of you to do so. Once you make it, stay true to who you are and make sure that once you have a seat at the table, that you bring chairs to invite mm. other people at that table because it takes a village and your vibe affects your tribe and then your tribe affects your vibe. Yes, oh, that was amazing. I'd like to add also to the, um, to the question, as you're building your career and you're navigating, it's really important um, to have a mentor. It's really important to have you know, your sister friends, your guy friends, but also be really mindful. So you need to have those friends that are gonna hold you accountable, but also celebrate you as well. As Anne was saying, it's only one you, but there's many people that wanna be like you that might wanna steal your spot. So be able to have those friends that are gonna be ready to, you know, to tell you when things are not right and be ready to fight if things are not right, right? I see, I see one of my friends out there nodding. Um, also when you're in that spot, as I just said, you know, be able to lift those people that are behind you up as well. Be able to be that mentor, that sounding board. We're all busy, but it takes a few minutes to send a text. It takes a few seconds to just meet with someone to really encourage them. Particularly as black people, we have to continue to work together. When we think about the statistics about even closing the racial wealth gap, as the highest consumer group, all our businesses should be successful. So we have to continue to encourage and be mindful when we're doing business with each other, hiring each other, but most importantly, be there to support each other as well. So we are at about time for a question and answer. I did want to kind of pull out some things that I heard here and across your answers. One is the amount of, like that you're all advocating in some ways an amount of self-knowing, right, and self-acceptance and an understanding that any institution is made up of the people who make it up, and so the moment you're there, you're there, and you're part of it, and it is you, and not to question that. Um, but it also, you know, on some level, is about, a, like, sort of fielding the nonsense. All of you talk about sort of expressing a kind of patience and grace. And I think about this, we started with Katanji Brown Jackson, and when we first met to talk about this panel, it was in the thick of the hearings and I was steaming. The, she was required to be so much more a patient, a human, um, than I think I am capable of, right? Um, and, but it sounds like you all have experiences where you met nonsense and had to not return nonsense to the people before you. And I just want to flag that that takes energy um, and required too much can take a toll. So in there, like I'm always a little, um, you know, fussy about the language of self-care because I'm like, self-care? Like why don't we make some change? We don't take care of ourselves so much. But I think the part that is the world's not gonna change as fast as we need it to. And so to be able to, as they say on The Simpsons, push out the jive and bring in the love mm -hmm. is actually a tremendously important thing to do. Um, and with that, let's take some questions from, from y'all. I saw this hand go up fast right here in front. And you can, there are if you wanna come down to the mics and that way I won't miss you. Um, hi, I'm Monique Harris and I'm a graduate of Cal State University Hayward, which is now Cal State 
East Bay. Um, but I kind of want to pull off of what you said in terms of self-care, because that's something that we're all struggling with all the time, and it's, it's a word that's out there, but what does that mean and what does that look like for each of you? Mm. Mm. I'll start. I just talked about this at a session. Self-care is very important because you can't pour from an empty cup. And if you yourself are drained, how can you expect to help and be successful to others? So how I take care of myself is I love a good spa. So once a month, I will go to the spa and treat myself. I will just take a mental health day and have a Netflix and chill day, whether I'm watching TV or reading a good book or immersing myself in something that's going on on the television. I'll do things of that nature. I'll take a walk. I'm very into fitness as well. I am exercise six days a week. I'm up at 6 a.m. getting my workout in because that helps me start my day. When you can take care of yourself physically, mentally, you're better, you're sharper, you're more adept. And so I just want to echo that health is wealth. And I'm trying to live as long and as well as I possibly can. So exercising and eating right are so key to taking care of oneself. And so just doing what you would like to do, um, whether that's, again, reading, walking, seeing family members, spending time with loved ones, do what you have to do to take care of yourselves because burnout is real. And I'll be 35 in August, and I'm learning the importance of boundaries. So eight to five are my work hours, and unless it's a, an email or text from my CEO or boss, that email can wait until the next day. Because especially since I work from home remotely, I could be working 24-7. So establishing those boundaries early and politely putting people in their places when they try to cross those boundaries is just as important. So I just encourage all of you all, whatever you do, just do something for yourselves to make yourself feel better, but to take care of yourself not only inwardly, but outwardly too. I'll just build on that very briefly. I'm in the self-care business. Um, I run a company, we make candles, lotions, all kinds of great smelling stuff. That was a shameless plug. <laughs> if you're in anthropology and you need a candle, that's us. Um, but I say that because I spend probably 50% of my day, if not 75% of my day, thinking about what self-care means to each of you. And what I had to really figure out very quickly is I can't be in the self-care business. I can't be selling you and telling you about self-care if I'm not doing it myself. Mm -hmm. And that's back to being authentic and being true. And when you do something, have it be aligned with who you are. So I'm gonna tell you something, and this is a small thing, but since I have been about 25, maybe around that age, I have committed that every single night I will get eight hours of sleep. Mm. I know, I see the wows. <laughs> and I get the questions. They're like, how are you a CEO? How are you a mom? Because I have a 12-year-old son. How are you a, a, I now have my mother living with me, so I live in a multi-generational household. How in the world do you get eight hours of sleep? And the short answer is, because I take my butt to bed. <laughs> and that's the truth. If it's not done, I stop. If it can wait till the morning, it does. And that's the real simple answer in all of this. And I know it's harder to, to do than it is to say. But if we don't actually do it, it's just a concept. Mm -hmm. And we're living in concepts of self-care. And I should be doing this. And then the other thing we do is we beat ourselves up when we don't do it, mm -hmm. which is even worse, right? You already need self-care. And then you, like not being caring at all to yourself, giving yourself some grace when you don't do it. And so whatever that is for you, if you work out, if you do other things, read books, but do it and do it faithfully and commit to it and figure out what else in your life is throwing it off sync or out of kilter or off kilter out of sync. That was the better way to say that. Um, but what's throwing it out of balance because there's something else going on. You know, I was, as a side note, I was thinking about this panel when we were coming here today and this whole idea of black girl magic and the fact that we're magical. And we all believe inherently that we can do the impossible. Sometimes that can also set us up for this path to perfectionism, mm. this path to I can make a way out of no way no matter what, 
And then what happens is we burn ourselves out. We wear ourselves out trying to, to live up to this magical, mystical, majestical spirit and space. We're all human. Mm -hmm. Even those of us who someone recommended us to sit up on this panel because we've had some life lessons that we're sharing with you today, we're all human. We struggle with the same things. And so when we think about being magical, I like to think more about, we know how to work magic. Maybe we don't need to be magical, because that's a high bar, y'all. Amen. Mm -hmm. It's a high bar, and I don't want us to be disappointed when we aren't perf perfection personified. We can be great, and we are great, just as we are. We don't have to be magical. We don't have to be anybody but who we are mm -hmm. every day in every way. Yep. Mm -hmm. I'll jump in. I'd, I would definitely encourage everyone to position themselves to do what you love. And in doing that, keeping your financials in order so you can invest in yourself. So if you want to get your hair done, go on a nice vacation, go to the spa, it's not a struggle. But then also stop and celebrate. Celebrate all, all the small, small victories and also big victories as well. And, I, and for me, um, what balances me out, that's, just what, that's what I do. I celebrate. I definitely invest in myself. I love nice vacations. But you know, you definitely have to stop and reflect. And if you live in a busy household, I wish I couldn't sleep eight hours a night. <laughs> but I do get up extra early so I can spend that quiet time alone to just do that reflection. And that's really important to start my day. We have a question right here. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thanks for uh, being on this panel. I'm Alex Swain, due class 2013. Um, and my question is, and exactly what you were getting at, that's what I got up out of my seat and was so excited to ask because I'm at a point in my career where like, um, I'm just now realizing how much work, like ha in the back of your head, you always have the twice as hard, work twice as hard to get half as far. And you know, that's what you hear growing up from parents. And I'm just now realizing how much that's ingrained in me and how much mental effort and work that has, uh, how, that takes and that has taken on, you know, you know, the way I present in the world and, you know, uh, you know, mental health and everything. So I'm just wondering how y'all deal with the perfectionism of, you know, being a black woman and holding yourself to the high standards and how, how do you deal with that with, with still being real and taking care of yourself? So I'll get started on that <clears throat> as a graduate of Princeton and Duke. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like uh, that kind of control freak thing is built into who I am, right? And it's part of how we get to where we get. And, you know, forgive yourself for that. It is what it is. Um, I think we, and, and this is maybe going to be a little controversial to say here in this group, right? Because this, we, are talk, we are celebrating black excellence this weekend. But we do, we talk about black people in two ways, right? We talk about, about black excellence and we talk about black pathology, right. right? And I'll just put in a plug for black ordinariness. Amen, sister, amen, amen. Right? Like, you know, you do get to not be the CEO if you don't want to be the that's CEO. Right. That's right. Mm. Right? And I'm, and I'm not saying that doesn't mean that's not something you should strive for, but when you sit in a room like this and it's just like, Oh well, my God, mm -hmm. what do I have? I got to do all these things. Like these women have been running off their resume. Look, I've been broke, broke. <laughs> Talk about Gen Xers. Anybody remember school days? Yes. Um, when the lady who's now Mrs. Uh, what's her name on the, whatever, she's in Tyler Perry movies. She said, <laughs> you broke and on the ground, right? <laughs> so when I, you know, I've, I've been in all the different places. Right, and sometimes you just have to, you know, forgive yourself for that. Um, give yourself. Uh, Anne talked about this, and and I really want to really drive the idea of authenticity home, because you do not get to take care of yourself. You do not get to have the career you want if you are not fully, authentically yourself. 
And not just that you are fully authentically yourself out there, but you are fully authentically yourself to yourself, right? There are stories that you have been telling that you can let go of. Amen. And nothing will happen. Amen. And uh, the worst that will happen is it will bring people to you mm-hmm. and you will be able to see people like you. Uh, you know, one of the, the, the reasons I, I love Melvia so much was Melvia was the first actual grown woman that I had seen who had gone to a black woman who had gone to a competitive school and was just still normal, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? Like, was like the people I knew from growing up. Uh, so um, the perfectionism, I mean, it's just going to always be a part of you because that's what got you here. Um, and it's, you know, but you can... But you can let yourself off the hook sometimes as well. So I'm going to jump in there because I think I learned that lesson a little bit as an undergraduate going to Harvard. And I will tell you, 18-year-old me was unbearable. Like she yes, was absolutely so arrogant, you know. And I sort of showed up and I was like, I'm the smartest person I've ever met. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't say that to my big sister because I would have gotten beaten up, but I still felt it pretty, you know. And then I got somewhere where I was actually pretty average, right? Like I wasn't the most accomplished. I was not, I was smart, but I wasn't the most palpably intelligent person. Um, And my response at first was to retreat to my friend Katie, who I knew from Duke Nerd Camp, to Katie's common room and watch Family Feud reruns instead of going to camp. Until one day, Katie, who's a white woman from, or white girl at the time, from Metairie, who would just be like, you can't just stay here watching the feud. You got to go to school, right? <laughs> and so eventually I went back, to, I went back to, to classes. But I realized in that like, semester of funk that, like, okay, I'm not the smartest person I've ever met, but I still actually like myself more than I like most other people, right? Like, I'm still the most interesting person that I know. You know, like all of those things that you say to feed yourself so that being the most accomplished or the most kind of like visibly awesome doesn't like, you don't need the feedback so much because I was generating something from inside of me. And then the other thing that happened, and you know, it's the early days of grade inflation. It's gotten worse since y'all were in college. Let me tell you as a college professor. But in those early days of, early-ish days of grade inflation, I realized at some point that in most of my classes, I could do all of the work in the world and get a B plus, or I could do very little work and get a B plus. And I was like, well, let's think strategically about this, <laughs> you know? And then like, one, stop over-investing in the A. Figure out the stuff that really animates me. And like, and of course, be willing, like learn. It's college, you're supposed to learn broadly as best as you can. But also like, there's doing the work and then there's like in deeply going deep on something. And sort of where I went deep was no longer driven by somebody else's acknowledgement of what I was doing and it was driven by what animated me. And I think I became a freer thinker, like not free thinking like sort of 19th century movements, but like less beholden to what somebody else told me was important um, and more like accepting of myself. That doesn't mean that I stopped trying to grow, but I stopped being mad at myself when somebody else wasn't telling me how great I was. And I will tell you also something from the, you know, from this whatever leadership, whatever boss side. Most everybody is doing C work. So if you are doing B plus work, you are doing really good. Yeah. You, I <laughs> ahead of the curve. I made the mistake of telling a student who got mad about a grade one time that, um, like, she thought she had gotten too low. And I was like, given the grade inflation rampant in the academy, very few people get lower than the grade they deserve, which is not the thing to say to someone when they're upset to you about their grade. <laughs> But I wasn't wrong. You live and you learn. Yeah. First, uh, good, uh, good afternoon. My name is Henry McMillan. I'm from Babson College. <laughs> really. <laughs> uh, I, I rise as a father, and I, I have a 16-year-old daughter. <clears throat> we struggled <clears throat> through COVID. <clears throat> and I just want to know how to encourage her <clears throat> as a father. <clears throat> And I've heard you all on your panels. I just want to know how to be a better father so that I can make her successful. Mm-hmm. And 
Mm. That's my question. Mm. Well, what I can say is you probably already are the best father. Uh, ever. Amen. 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 I mean, kudos to you yeah. for standing up and asking this question in here. Anybody got any tissue? He may. I know. I mean, I'm not. <laughs> Because I don't even know the answer, but I just know that you standing here and being vulnerable right. to even ask the question, yeah. that's actually the answer you're looking for, is vulnerability. And, and you are doing it already. Be vulnerable, understand her needs, listen to her. But I don't know any more than that, yeah. just simply to say that. I'm also I, the parent of two 16-year-olds. Oh, Ooh. Lordy. Mm. Uh, amen. <laughs> Um, and one of the things I want to say to the black men in this room, I know, right? and, and I think it goes back to that original question about massage and war. Um, we love you, we are not the same. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And you, if you're an ally, that is powerful. Mm -hmm. Right? So every black woman is not your enemy. Every black woman don't want to be with you, right? <laughs> Amen. Amen, right? Right. Um, check, check that And out. we move through the world um, just very differently, right? Was to say in all the, all the blacks are men and all the women are white, mm -hmm. right? So there are, not a, there are not a lot of spaces for us. Mm -hmm. So a, male, a black man is your ally and this is for those of you who are partners, mm -hmm. is a powerful, powerful thing. Powerful. Mm -hmm. And so when she comes to you, believe her. Mm. Always believe her, yeah. right? Trust her and protect her. That doesn't mean walk up on stage and slap nobody. That means... <laughs> <laughs> Am I wrong, though? No, you are not wrong. <laughs> you are 100% you are correct. That's what made it beautiful. <laughs> um, <laughs> I would like to add to okay, that as you. well. <laughs> um, so I had such an outstanding father and he was present in my life and he had really high expectations for us. So I, at, in sixth grade, he started teaching us vocabulary words, 10 vocabulary words a week. So he had a plan for all of us and he also made sure we were well-rounded. So in addition to academics, I play piano, I play trumpet, I played piano for Queen Elizabeth's Night in London, England. I played trumpet and piano in Cuba and Africa. So he exposed me to these things at a young age and he was there for me. He took me prom dress shopping. Uh, we would go to Burger King and I would slide down the slide. I loved the, the sport of golf and he built a little miniature golf course for me at the house. So he was there, even during my days of being bullied. He went to the school, he went to the superintendent, he went to the teachers, he had my back. Mm -hmm. So not only for you to just be present and listen, but to instill that excellence in your daughter. Because at the time, I thought my dad was so strict. But now looking back, I'm like, oh, he knew exactly what he was doing. Because even when I'm in interviews with clients and consultants and even Hollywood people, I find I have so much in common because of how dad exposed me to different things. We went to church on Sunday, mother grew up Baptist, dad was Episcopalian, so I'm of two faiths. So be there for your daughter, support her, encourage her, but set those high expectations because when she gets in the real world, it will make her that much better, it will make her stand out even more, and it will make people look at her differently, like, whoa, who raised you? So again, mm -hmm. kudos to you for asking that question. And I would love to talk to your daughter. I mentor teenage girls all the time. Yeah. So please come get my business card when you leave. Yeah. Our, our dad must have been cousins or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I would say um, she ha definitely has some Babs and auntie. So definitely, we, I definitely want to um, speak with her as well. But I just think, I, I'm a daddy's girl. My dad's deceased. Mm -hmm. But it's definitely listening and being there for her. And as my fellow panelists said, you know, is listening. If she's saying something, it's, it's right, it's right. And I just think this is a critical time. At 16 years old, there's a lot going on, but making sure that she has other supports as well. So making sure that the, her friends and the people that you allow in her life 
are going to be the best options for her. So really vet them out carefully because you know right now is going to set the rest of her um, rest of her life. So she definitely has plenty of um, babs and aunties. So we Thank definitely you. want to connect with her. Yes. So, you know, and, I, can I just say one other thing? I had an aha moment sitting up on the stage, and often when I do panels like this, I have aha moments. I realize why I can't answer your question because my father was not in my life. Hmm. And so my message to those of you who are mothers, who have fathers who aren't in your daughter's lives, take heed to this question that this brother just asked. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there are good reasons that fathers aren't in some daughter's lives. Mine was a good reason. But nonetheless, women need men in their lives and father figures in their lives. And for those of you who are fathers or men in women's lives, young girls' lives, know that it's awkward. Mm -hmm. It's natural to be awkward. Like, we don't speak necessarily the same language all the time, and it's okay, but just be there. Mm -hmm. So I, I thank you, brother, for asking that question because you actually created an aha in me on why I couldn't even answer your question sitting up yeah. here on this stage. So thank you for that. Thank you. And I think your point is important, that it doesn't take a father to be a father figure. That's right. Mm -hmm. Right? That's right. And that, so my mother-in-law is a therapist who's worked a lot with children and right. children who've been in horrible situations. And one of the things that she always says is like, it just takes one person mm -hmm. in a kid's corner for them to come out of okay. right. Mm -hmm. Right? And if your daughter, like, and we're talking about fatherhood, we could talk about, but if like, if your child knows that you're in her corner, and that might be this kind of like, I love, I'm imagining Venus Williams' dad mm -hmm. as your dad, right? But like a father who's like got a plan and he's sort of working it, that's one thing. If it's a father where like, you know, the child does not want to do what you want them to do, but you can have a conversation so she learns that she can be heard and there can be disagreements and people can still love one another, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like that's also something. Like it's, there are a lot of ways to do it, but the key is just to love unconditionally and to like help her understand that her job is to become herself. Yes. Right? And you're there, you've got good ideas because you've got experience and time, right? Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, a, it's a group project. Mm -hmm. Right? That's going to involve more than just the two of you. And I do. The clarifying thing for me was also realizing, oh yeah, where does this come from? It was kind of going through the world knowing both parents, but expressed more ridiculously in my father's, that my father loved the merit out of me. Mm -hmm. Right? And to be that sort of fully loved meant that I should probably like honor his good taste, which he was always telling me was good taste, <laughs> by loving myself too. You know? No. Learning a Thank lot you. about you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, Hello. We, yeah, we have time for one question, yes. and it is from you. And this is going to be quick, and it's relatable. I'm glad that he came down. Um, I think I'm cousins with your fathers. Okay. So <laughs> I, my name is Keenan Mann. I'm from Wake Forest University, and um, today is my daughter's sixth birthday. Wow. So um, the, the intro to my question was exactly what he said. As a girl dad, um, I attended an event yesterday at Wake Forest University that was black female-led. And it, it focused very heavily on the experiences of frustrated black female undergraduate students mm -hmm. at a PWI. Mm -hmm. As a black male who was there, I felt very much my masculine and manhood present. And I wanted to do something, because I'm a girl dad. So I was like, I, I spoke in front of them and said, I, I'm a girl dad, so I just want to hug every girl here. Like, I just want to embrace her, because my baby is home, and I just want to be like, it's okay. So one of the girls just ran up to me and cried on my shoulder. So it led me to the question, yeah, pass the, t pass the tissue. <laughs> we got it, it's ready. <laughs> but, um, and I'm also an English teacher at a middle school, so um, kudos, because I, yes, every day. But my question was, how do we embrace how do I embrace, how do we embrace frustrated, hurt, and um, yeah, frustrated and hurt black girls and black women mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. who are undergraduate students. I told them, I said, I'm carrying this with me where I'm going tomorrow. But that's the question. It is related to being a girl dad, but also being a professional and an alumnus when we know that our girls need us. Yeah, I'll start off. 
Being an administrator, I want to make sure that there is proper systems and people in place throughout campus because we don't know where and when things are going to happen. So from an administrative standpoint, making sure that our black female students are aware of all the services that we provide, and then also if there's a gap, creating these opportunities for them. But most importantly, being there to listen. Now, I commute, I live an hour and 20 minutes away from campus. However, all of the black female students know how to get a hold of me. We have a system of communicating together. So we, we have our staff channel, we have our uh, a channel for the students. But making sure that they feel comfortable, particularly being away from their family, that they have an extended family on campus that's gonna be with them at a drop of a dime. So that's what I pride myself on. I'm glad to be back in that role and also being a role model. So it is challenging, and they're dealing with things that we've dealt with when we were in undergrad, right? But there's so many great opportunities. So when, they're, when we're in a leadership position, making sure we leverage that to support our own. Excellent. I was going to say the same thing. Um, but one of the things that I do when I talk to young people, particularly young women, is to remind them to be cognizant of their social media and their Facebook and their Instagram and their TikToks. So definitely have those resources on campus, like you just mentioned. But just to be mindful of what you post out there. Maybe don't post so provocatively, don't use so much profanity, because people are watching. College scholarships have been rescinded, job, job offers have been rescinded, simply because of what you post on social media. So I try to conduct myself so that even my grandmother, if she were living, she could see what I post on social media. My boss, my boss follows me on social media because I'm very cognizant of what I post, because once it's out there, it's out there. So I just encourage young women to find a tribe that supports you, that values you. Peer pressure is real. If they're trying to encourage you to do things you don't want to do, that's not the circle for you. So having those professors or uh, community centers, I both attended PWIs, NC State, and USC, and especially working in the Black Alumni Association, I got asked that question a lot. So they came to our offices, or we would send them to the Center for Black Cultural and Student Affairs, or they would, I would give my cell number to my students and they would text me, Miss Tensey, I'm dealing with this. I had a, a student text me the other day how a housing was trying to take a student out, gave them a uh, one day notice, a black student, unfair, and she's like, Tensey, do you know any black lawyers? I immediately sent her six black lawyers that I knew on the spot and the um, incident was handled. So just having that strong support system um, is very beneficial. Yeah, and I'll just add two quick things. I, I think that we live in two kinds of cultures right now, and we all are familiar with the third one, but I call them my three C's, but the two that I think are relevant here, um, cancel culture, we know, but comparison culture mm. is real, and that's that social media is, is helping to drive that, and I think our young people, I see it, I have a 16-year-old bonus daughter, and she compares herself constantly to everyone around her. That's normal and natural to have some level of peer to peer to peer kind of look at, but it's overwhelming, her comparison and the comparison culture. And then I think the other one is coddle culture. Mm. We are coddling our folks too much and they don't know how to thrive, how to work their way out of some situations. Yes. Now, I'm not saying let them flounder I'm not saying let them be hurt.